Good afternoon. Um, my name is Lacey Crawford, Jr. I'm Communications Director for Social Security Work. Thank you for joining us today. Nancy Altman, our co-director and co-author of the new book, Social Security Work, Why Social Security Isn't Going Broke, and How Expanding It Will Help Us All, will be moderating the call today. At the end of the call, I'm going to ask any reporters on to hit star six so that we can open it up for Q&A and then you can follow the prompt. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Nancy. Thank you, Lacey, and welcome, everyone. Um, on our call, we will be hearing from Senator Bernie Sanders. We'll be hearing from Terry O'Neill, President of the National Organization for Women, and from Dr. Benjamin Zetke, Director of Policy and Research for Social Security Works. Social Security Works is releasing today a new report on Social Security and Income Inequality, authored by Dr. Vecti. The perilous rise in income inequality has harmed Social Security's financing. Expanding is an important part of the solution to this upward redistribution of wealth. In 1982, I served as Alan Greenspan's assistant on the Bipartisan Commission to develop the recommendations that led to the Social Security Amendments of 1983. When those amendments were enacted, Social Security was projected to be able to pay all benefits through 2057. Now benefits are projected to be paid in full only through 2033. What happened? What no one foresaw back then, 1982 and through 1983, was the upward redistribution of wealth we have seen since then. Opponents of Social Security don't want us to focus on that fact. They try to distract us. This is not new. Back in 1936, President Franklin Roosevelt reminded us, quote, it is an old strategy of tyrants to delude their victims into fighting their battles for them. Then the money interests were seeking to turn workers against Social Security. In the last few years in the budget battles we've seen, they tried to turn young against the old. Today, in the fight over disability insurance, they are seeking to turn the old against the disabled. In magic, it's called this misdirection. Direct us from the, you know, try to distract us from the real action. Today, with this report and this call, we will seek to pull the curtain back and redirect our gaze to where it belongs on our income and wealth inequality. To start that discussion, I have the great privilege to introduce Senator Bernie Sanders, independent from Vermont. He is the ranking member on the Senate Budget Committee, and in the last Congress, he was chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee. Most importantly for this call, he is, was, has been among the earliest and strongest and loudest champions for Social Security, fighting to protect and expand this vital program. Senator Sanders? Well, Nancy, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and, and uh, thank you for all the work uh, that uh, Social Security Works does, uh, and thank you for your fight to make sure that we are not going to cut benefits. Uh, I think the point that you made a moment ago is a point that not a lot of people are aware of, and that is while we may want to look at the huge transfer of income and wealth from the middle class to the top 1% or the top one-tenth of 1% as a moral issue, in fact, it is also a huge economic issue, and it also impacts Social Security to a very significant degree. And the reason for that is that if working people are earning less than they used to, then they're contributing less into the Social Security trust fund than they otherwise would have. And if the wealthy are becoming much wealthier, it means that we have more and more people who are above the cap, which is today at $118,000. If the payroll tax had continued to cover 90% of all earnings rather than 83% that it currently covers, the Social Security Trust Fund would be able to pay every benefit 
owed to, owed to every eligible American, not just for the next 18 years, which is the case, but for the next 38 years. Instead, more than $1.1 trillion has been pocketed by the wealthiest people in this country instead of going into the Social Security Trust Fund. And as you've indicated, this is an issue that we must deal with, and unfortunately our Republican friends choose to ignore it. Uh, on top of that, what the Republicans are now doing is creating uh, a phony crisis in terms of the shortfall in the disability uh, trust fund. And with that shortfall, what they are saying is that, well, either we're going to cut disability insurance by 19%, which is literally beyond comprehension, because many of the people who receive disability today are living in poverty, uh, and their disabilities make life difficult enough as it is, but to cut their benefits by 19% is literally unthinkable. But then on the other hand, what the Republicans are saying, well, if you don't want to do that, then maybe we'll cut the Social Security program in general. Maybe we'll raise the retirement age. Maybe we'll come forward with a uh, chain CPI or other cuts in Social Security. Uh, my response to that is twofold. One, short term, obviously, we should do as the President has indicated, and as 11 other has occurred on 11 other occasions uh, in recent history on the Democratic and Republican presidents, and that is transfer money from the retirement fund into the disability fund. That's what the president proposed doing over a five-year period. But longer term, if we are interested in increasing, extending the solvency of Social Security beyond 18 years, what we have got to do is lift the cap on taxable income which is now at 118000 you can start at $250,000. And what the Social Security Administration has told us, and their actuary has told us, you do that, you're going to make Social Security solvent for the next 40 years on top of the 18 years of solvent. And I think we should also be talking about expanding benefits, certainly not cutting benefits. So short term, we're going to shift money from one fund to the other, it's been done 11 times. Long term, let's lift the cap uh, and uh, extend Social Security for uh, decades uh, to come. So let me uh, just uh, thank uh, Social Security Works and you, Nancy, and your staff for doing a great job. We're going to rally the American people, uh, and together we are going to prevent any cuts to the Disability Trust Fund, Social Security or General, and in fact, our goal is to expand coverage because so many Social Security beneficiaries need just that. So once again, thank you very much. Uh, and with your permission, I'm going to have to get off the phone. Thank you so much, Senator. And it's now my very great privilege to introduce my colleague and good friend, Terry O'Neill, who is out there fighting for women as the president of the, and for really for all of us, as the president of the National Organization for Women. Gary? Thank you so much. And uh, thank, I want to send out a really big thanks to Senator Sanders. He has been a true champion for us on Capitol Hill as we have fought so hard to stop uh, attacks on Social Security and, in fact, to get expanded benefits for Social Security. And, Nancy, I want to thank you especially for the awesome work that you and Eric Hansen have put out, Social Security Work, anybody on this call who has not gotten a copy of the book, I highly recommend it. It's accessible, it's readable, really lays things out and shows how we expand it, how we take it, and why all the naysayers are asking ideologically or, uh, or, or economically driven and not fact driven. So it's a wonderful book. And, and then, Becky, I know it's going to be speaking, and I just read the paper um, that has been released, and it's amazing. It is between the Social Security Report and then your new paper. It's a real breath of fresh air is getting some needed um, deep analysis and, and actual evidence before the people of the U.S. so we can really start having an intelligent conversation. As Senator Sanders said, this is a moral issue as well as an economic issue. Well, I'm here to tell you that it's also a feminist issue. 
women rely on our Social Security system, system very disproportionately. Women are already saddled with a, a gendered wage gap. So on average, 77 cents on the dollar. I'm sure all, everybody is familiar with that. African American women are making just 64 cents to the dollar, and Latinas, it's more like 59 cents to the dollar uh, paid to white men. So what you see for women is low earnings. That a lot of it is because women cluster in low wage occupation. 70% of kids workers in the United States are women. Two-thirds of minimum wage workers, non-tip minimum wage workers, are women. So we cluster in these lower paid occupations, and we have higher expenses. Women are far more likely to have financial responsibility, not only for their own children, but also for their elders. That means health care and education costs and, and housing and clothing and all the rest of it. So women have less money coming in the door during their working lifetime, more money going out the door during their working lifetime. They get to their retirement, they are very deeply relying on Social Security, and not least of which is because in those low paid jobs where women predominate, they don't have pensions and they don't have 401 k so, so Social Security is what women have. For women, and particularly for women of color, the disability portion of our Social Security system is especially important. African-American women experience health disparities that are related to stress at, a, at a, a shocking level. Um, the, the mortality rate from breast cancer for African-American women are much higher than for white women. The rate of um, stress-related chronic diseases like, um, like uh, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, and diabetes, that is much higher for um, African-American women because of stress related to the everyday indignities of working at extremely low wages within a system that, that remains very racially polarized in this country. So, so the disability system is particularly important to lower wage women and to, and to women of color. That is what makes this a feminist issue. And for the privatizers, these are the guys who are manufacturing these phony crises in order to justify privatizing Social Security. For them to try to pit retirees against people with disability is, is probably the lowest that they've come. I thought they couldn't think much lower than those Alan Simpson is running around calling uh, older people greedy geezers trying to divide them against the younger. That feels. Now they're trying to pit retirees against people with disabilities. That's going to fail, too. And the reality is, these guys are losing their moral standards, not just their credibility. So I'll stop here and uh, turn it back over to you, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry, for those remarks and for your leadership. And next, it's my privilege to, invite, to introduce Dr. Benjamin Beckton, who is Director of Policy and Research for Social Security Works and the author of the report released just today called Social Inequality, Retirement Security, and the Future of Social Security. Ben? Thank you, Nancy. It's an honor to be on the call with you and with Senator Sanders and Terry O'Neill. Um, as, as the Senator said, since the late 1970s, economic forces have enabled the, the privileged few to take home more and more in the form of income and profits, while the wages of average workers have stagnated. Rather than combat this trend, our public policies have strongly reinforced it. This has both hurt Social Security's finances and created a retirement income crisis looming for today's workers. In response to the highly unequal 21st century economy, Congress should reform Social Security by asking high earners to to contribute to Social Security on all of their income at the same rate as other Americans. Such reforms do not amount to soaking the rich, as opponents would claim, who, um, because the, the wealthy would also receive higher Social Security benefits as a result of these additional contributions. Instead, they are part of a necessary rebalancing of our public policy framework after decades of upward redistribution. Social Security payroll taxes are levied only on wages up to the Social Security tax cap currently $118,500 a year. Yet from 1979 to 2012, all aggregate income growth has gone to the top 10% of the income hierarchy. With nearly all aggregate income growth occurring outside of the Social Security system, it is unsurprising that Social Security's finances have suffered from income inequality. Indeed, slow and unequal wage growth has caused a significant share, at least one-third and probably more, 
of a long-term shortfall in Social Security which has emerged since the 1983 reforms. U.S. tax policy reforms, far from reducing market income inequality, have been increasing it. TARP marginal income tax rates, as well as taxes on unearned income paid primarily by the wealthy, have been dramatically reduced since 1980. Today, among the 32 OECD countries for which data are available, the United States now ranks 28, 28 out of 32, in terms of the effectiveness of our policies in reducing income inequality. So there's plenty of scope for improvement. There are several implications of rising inequality for Social Security policy. In response to slow and unequal wage growth, Congress should first of all expand Social Security benefits. While Social Security benefits may have been adequate in the 1980s, slow and unequal wage growth cuts to Social Security benefits and the collapse of the other two legs of the retirement stool make benefits inadequate today and in the future, indicating a strong need to expand Social Security beyond its current average benefit of $15,640 a year. Second, Congress should eliminate the Social Security tax cap. Social Security's revenue base should be broadened to encompass high incomes. The payroll tax cap was already uh, eliminated for Medicare Part A hospital insurance in 1994 without any clearly discernible impact on the economy. Senator Sherrod Brown's Strengthening Social Security Act is one of several proposals currently in Congress that would scrap the Social Security tax cap to fund expanded benefits and extend the system solvency until late into this century. Third, Congress should take measures to stimulate wage growth. Stronger long-term wage growth, 1.76% per year over the long term rather than the currently projected 1.13%, would reduce Social Security's long-term shortfall by over one-third. Congress should invest in infrastructure and in education and training, raise the minimum wage, and make it easier for workers to bargain for fair wages. Each of these measures would lessen inequality and thereby improve Social Security's finances. So would closing the gender pay gap. Finally, in response to rising wealth inequality, there are a range of measures Congress could pursue. Two of the most promising are, first, incorporate high earners' investment income into Social Security. The Affordable Care Act has already set the precedent for subjecting, subjecting investment income to social insurance contributions with its new Medicare Net Investment, investment Income Tax, or NIIT. Starting in 2013, it levies a 3.8% tax on the unearned income of those with modified adjusted gross income above $200,000 a year or $250,000 a year for couples. Both to reduce income inequality and to keep pace with overall income growth, Social Security should also incorporate the investment income of high earners into its contribution and benefit base. Second, Congress should restore the estate tax to its 2000 level and dedicate it to Social Security. From the late 1930s through the 1970s, the top federal estate tax rate in the United States was always 70% or above, with a low exemption amount. The exemption amount in 2015 is $5,430,000, almost $11 million per couple. It's such a high exemption amount, fewer than two of every 1,000 estates, less than one-fiftieth of one percent of estates, now owe any estate tax. Earmarking these revenues for Social Security is supported both by the history of the Social Security program and the particular nature of the estate tax. A fuller account of this uh, argument can be found in our fact sheet, which was released today online. The combined effect of scrapping the cap and incorporating capital income into Social Security would simply be that high earners would contribute to Social Security on all of their income at the same rate as the typical worker does today. Strengthening Social Security to better respect changes in our economy and society would make it the cornerstone for middle-class retirement security in the 21st century. Thank you very much. And with that, probably if you let me turn it back to you. All right. So for any reporters on the line, if you would uh, like to ask a question, I ask that you hit star six now, and I'll follow the prompt. So we're going to wait a moment to see if there are any questions. Did you see your child having to serve the zero hour RJF now? Um, so, I've been listening to the call with, you know, long, very long-term budget constraints and the deficit and all the stuff that we hear. Um, can we really afford to expand social security benefits through increasing tax revenue alone? I'm sorry, I missed the last part of the question. Can we afford to do it through revenue alone? Yeah. Through additional tax 
that yes. you want. Sure. Do you want me to take Do you want to take that? Sure. Sure. Um, sure. Um, thank you for the question. Um, yes, we can definitely afford to do it through revenue alone because if, because if, with an average benefit of $15,000 per year, uh, we certainly can't afford to do it uh, to, to uh, secure Social Security long-term finances by cutting benefits. Uh, we have a retirement security crisis. Uh, that is the major public policy challenge in retirement security policy is how do you solve that crisis? Um, Social Security is the component of our retirement security uh, policy uh, uh, portfolio that works best. It's worked great for 80, 80 years, providing retirement security to millions of Americans and to multiple generations. Um, and the other two legs of retirement still have not worked as well. Defined benefit pensions don't work as well in today's economy where people don't stay with the same firm um, and uh, for a lifetime. And uh, the, the rate of receipt of defined benefit pensions is dropping rapidly and uh, for future generations as well. And the uh, individual savings component of our retirement security portfolio has only really worked well for the top third of the income spectrum. So to solve the retirement income crisis that's awaiting today's workforce, we have to do something. Expanding Social Security benefits is the most promising option. Um, and we can the people who we're asking to contribute more can definitely afford to do so. Given that the vast majority of income growth has been accruing to high earners, it certainly seems both affordable and fair to ask them to contribute a portion, a small portion of this income growth to social insurance programs. And let me add to that excellent answer. But we are the wealthiest nation in the world. Not only are we the wealthiest nation in the world, we're the wealthiest um, in our entire history. We are wealthier than we were in 1935 when the program was started. And in 1939 when survivors' benefits were added, 1950s when disability benefits were added. There is no question we can afford to expand Social Security. We, at, at its most expensive, Social Security is projected to cost just a little over 6% of gross domestic product. Most of the OECD countries spend a much higher percentage of their GDP on their counterpart programs today. So the question isn't one of affordability. It's one of what is uh, what the American people want. And poll after poll after poll shows that the American people want to expand Social Security and want the wealthiest among us to pay their fair share. And Terry, do you want to add to that? Just, just very quickly, I just wanted to say I, I really love some of the um, – uh, it, it's not just scrapping the tax that puts more resources into the system. It's raising the wages of everybody. So, so 6% of their wage, you get more money into the system if you raise wages and bring down inequality. And I really love the idea of the um, – uh, paying back the legacy debt out of uh, higher estate taxes. I think that makes an enormous amount of sense. So what we're doing is identifying a lot of different uh, uh, sources of revenue coming into the system, not just grabbing the cap. Okay, and as a follow-up, with why wouldn't it, with this extra revenue and expanding the economy as a whole, make more sense to give people tax incentives to invest their money as they choose in various different retirement vehicles? Well, what people will do, who do, I should, let, who wants to go first on that one? Dan, do you want to address that, or you want Terry, or would you like well, to? Well, I'll, I'll make, oh, Terry, did you want to start, or? No, 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 go ahead. Oh, I, I wanted, I had one thought, um, which is simply that, you know, tax, if, if we spend more money, you know, which are called tax expenditures, when we give people tax breaks for their individual savings, when we do that, um, the, the higher that your income is, the higher your tax break uh, is that you receive for contributing to your IRA or 401k. So tax expenditures on private savings um, actually increase inequality by giving more money to the wealthier among us rather than combating inequality. So uh, whereas Social Security uh, is either neutral or has a slightly uh, – or does actually combat inequality. Um, Nancy? Yeah. So I think that, that there are a couple of points that really draw on the, the, that point and the point that Terry made to the first question, and that is that um, – what we need for secure retirement is something you guys can't, can't live. You need an annuity, not savings. That's what Social Security provides. It provides an annuity. Um, and, as, as, and if you are living um, paycheck to paycheck, you don't have much discretionary income. You know, Mitt Romney and turned out and it, it was revealed in the um, um, last election, last presidential election, that he had what millions and millions of dollars 
tax in a tax sheltered retirement savings account. That is something that we've got to have enough of. What we need is a program that is fair to all Americans that provides a, um, a fair benefit for those who are making minimum wage as well as those who are CEOs of Fortune 500 com companies. The answer is not more tax breaks, but it's to raise the wages of all workers so that they have more discretionary income and more ability to save. Terry, did you want to add anything? No. No, that's perfect. <laughs> All right, so I would like to remind any reporters on the line that you can press star six uh, to be placed in the queue, and then you would follow the prompt from there. So let's wait a minute or two to see if we have any more questions. All right, so if you would like a copy of the report, I ask that you go to socialsecurityworks.org, and it should be on our front page. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you to all the speakers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye.